فقد قال جل وعلا في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الذي أصرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع العليم صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من لسان يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم فعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وعلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين My respected brothers, elders and sisters Allah tabarak wa ta'ala Bless Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with many things. But at the same time, Allah ta'ala put Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through a lot of trials. Our beloved Prophet, peace be upon him, went through many different difficulties, trials. In fact, in the Battle of Uhud, which was the battle that the Muslims lost. Obviously, a loss, what we mean by loss is the Muslims had to recoup, they had to recover. They took a few losses. It wasn't a clear victory for the non-Muslims, but still the Muslims came out worse. <coughs> In that battle, the Prophet, he lost his uncle. Not only lost him, his beloved uncle. He was mutilated. Not only was he mutilated, one of the non-Muslims, a severe disbeliever at the time. She even made a necklace out of his insides. And so many other things. The Prophet himself was injured. After all of this, Aisha radiallahu anha, the beloved wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, came to him and asked him, just not so long after this, that was Uhud, the most difficult day you went past, you went through. Was it the most difficult time of your prophethood? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Uhud was bad. But worse than Uhud was long before, in Makkah. He said when I was persecuted in Makkah by my own people, my own family members, so I went out seeking other people, seeking ex assistance from elsewhere. I went to different tribes, different nations. And then my, my thoughts were set on Ta'if. He said, Ta'if, now they've got leaders, they're different, they're thoughtful, they're rational, they think. I should go to them, put my case in front of them. Maybe they'll be assistant of assistance. Even if they don't accept Islam, maybe it's a place where I can start my da'wah again, call again to Allah wa ta'ala and the truth. When I went to Ta'if, again, it was a three-day journey. He went only with one person. Not only did they not listen to him and even give him the courtesy of, you know, giving him some welcome, some hospitality. They ridiculed him, they mocked him. And then as Rasulullah was leaving, it was a two week whole ordeal. When he was leaving, they didn't even let him leave with peace. They sent the, the children on the streets, the urchins, the low lives, to go and throw pebbles at the Prophet. So much so that blood started to drip from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he even dampened his slippers. At that point, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who had gone through so much difficulty, you have to remember this was a year removed from the year of grief. What was the year of grief? When the Prophet lost his two pillars, foundations upon which he would depend upon. Abu Talib, his, his uncle. And Khadija al Kubra radiallahu anha, his beloved wife of, of 25 years. These two pillars, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he lost. He had no support in terms of worldly, in terms of uh, financially. And now he's gone to Taif and they've thrown him out. And they physically abused him, mentally abused him. Now what happens? This is Rasulullah said, this last day there in Taif, when I came and I rested under the tree, I'm injured. I'm hurt, I'm hungry, I'm far from home. I've got no support, not even a wife to go back home to. That, so that was my hardest time. And we have to now relate that to ourselves. When we go through hardship, Allah puts us through a hardship. And we go through another hardship and another one. Then suddenly you're looking and you see the light at the end of the tunnel. And you think it's all going to be over. And just when you think you've got out, Allah puts another hardship which belittles and is many times, many fold even more difficult than all the hardships that came before. Because Rasulullah had gone through so much. He'd lost his close ones. He'd gone to Ta'if. Now he thought this is going to be the end. And in Ta'if, this is what they did to him. So this is now we have to think this happens to us. 
Then what happened then? Rasulullah didn't waver. In fact, his belief increased. And he turned to Allah and he made dua, complained about his own weakness. And we see this is an example in the lives of many prophets. Yunus alayhi salam, when his people didn't believe, and he got upset, and he said, I'm going to leave. And, and he thought that Allah Taala he thought that Allah Taala is not going to give guidance to these people. So that was again hardship after hardship. What did Allah Taala do? Allah Taala showed discipline Yunus alayhi salam by obviously putting him in the well, in the whale, the belly of the fish, etc. And then Allah Taala relieved him because he showed to Allah that he was in need. So this is an example of different prophets. But what did Allah do for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam after this? From there, because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't waver. He didn't lose his reliance in Allah, he didn't turn away. From there, Allah started to change the tide. Straight from there. Like, not even from returning from Ta'if. At that point, one slave boy came just to give him grapes. And Rasulullah just made salam to him. And the slave boy said, no one says salam in this area. And then he spoke to him. And that person accepted Islam. From there, Allah is already changing the tide. After that, he comes back. That same year of Hajj, a delegation comes from Medina. And now already... Things are opening up for Rasulullah so a new community. Within that year, he gets married again, twice. So Allah straight away is changing, turning the tables for Rasulullah so purely because of his patience and his reliance, unnerving, unwavering. But the biggest gift Allah gave to Rasulullah so because of all this sacrifice was the gift of the night journey, <coughs> the ascension, Isra and Mi'raj. Isra is the night journey to Al-Aqsa and Mi'raj is going up to the heavens. And I wanted to talk about this today and we've got very less time now because this is Rajab and the, the dominant opinion is that the Mi'raj, the night journey did take place in Rajab, 27th Rajab. There's difference of opinion. Whether it did or not, this is, gives us a good opportunity to just speak about it and just highlight a few. I'm not going to go through the entire story. We know the story in general because it can come and fill in the gaps, inshallah. Um, don't congregate over there if possible. <coughs> So we know that Rasulullah saw some one night, so now he's come back to Makkah to al One night, Jibra'il and Islam, the few angels came, they washed his, his heart out. Then they took him, the Burak came, the animal, and they took him on the journey to Al-Aqsa first. And then from Al-Aqsa, Rasulullah saw some led the other prophets in prayer. Every single prophet was there. And then Rasulullah saw some started the ascension on the Burak, this animal, this uh, mystical animal. And all the way up to the heavens, and each heaven he met a different prophet. Jibreel Islam introduced him. Adam Alayhi Islam in the first heaven. Uh, Isa, uh, Yunus, Harun, and then Musa Alayhi Islam in the, fifth, in the sixth. And Ibrahim Alayhi Islam finally in the seventh heaven. And then obviously he went to Allah Taala and he got the gift of Salat. And then he was 50 first and then he came down all the way to five. We know all of this. So this is what happened in Isra and Miraj. I want to just stop on a few points and highlight so we can take a few lessons from this. First, <coughs> the importance of Salah. Allah wa ta'ala, for every single injunction, every single instru instru instruction of Allah wa ta'ala that he wanted to send, Allah sent Jibra'il alayhi salam or revelation to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi that you have to do this, tell your nation to do this. Ya ayyulladheena amanu or kullil mu'mineen, tell the believers to do this. But there's only one injunction, one act, Allah wa ta'ala didn't send Jibra'il alayhi salam, Allah called the Prophet to himself. Allah said, this is too dear to me. This is such a gift that I'm not going to send an angel. I'm going to call the Prophet to me and I'm going to give him this gift myself. And this was Salah. Allah didn't send Jibra'il alayhi salam to tell Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi that now your nation, your people have to read five times Salah. Allah said, you come up to me and you come to such a place where Jibra'il alayhi salam can't even come further. Sidratul Muntaha where Jibra'il alayhi salam couldn't even come further. And there Allah gave him a gift. And this gift was of Salah. Salah is such a thing that Allah then didn't just tell Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi these are the instructions and you do it and carry it out. Allah then sent Jibreel Islam, his greatest angel, the Holy Spirit, Ruh al-Qudus. Allah sent him down to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and two days in a row he practically taught Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam salah. On the first day he read at the beginning times, and the second day he read at the end times, so we understand the timings as well. And practically he led Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in salah twice. And even salah al khawf Jibreel Islam came and showed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said this is how the angels pray salah, when in battle, this is how you have to pray salah. This is the status of salah, for a believer, that at the time when Rasulullah was his lowest, Allah gave him this gift, knowing Rasulullah would be happy, but also is for the entire ummah, that you have a direct connection to Allah Taala, which no other previous nations had. They had certain acts or certain parts of the day, etc., or they had to be in the place of worship. Whereas salah for you is five times a day, 
and you can pray anytime you uh, any place in the world you want exception so this was a gift from Allah then Musa came and said that no I, I know about my people and they couldn't handle it so tell Allah to decrease and he came down to five the first thing we have to understand that we have to hold on to salah the second thing I mean you can talk about the wisdoms of each prophet one was Adam alayhi salam was in the first heaven and why was that because from the first heaven the actions go up uh, of all the creation so Adam alayhi salam is almost like he's the great grandfather and he's just looking at all his grandkids and what actions they're bringing up and he's monitoring them so he goes through Adam and Islam first so when I, I have to understand that when I'm doing an act that my great grandfather is watching whether he's watching or not but he gets a result he knows that okay this, this servant this, this child of mine we're all children of Adam he did such and such and such and this day so he gets to see all of these things this is one wisdom the scholars mention then the different different scholars we go up to Ibrahim and Islam the seventh heaven Rasulullah he says that he was resting against Baytul Ma'mur. Baytul Ma'mur is the equivalent of the Kaaba for the angels. Why was he resting against this? Because he created or he was the builder of the Kaaba. So that's why Allah Taala blessed him with um, having uh, being able to rest against Baytul Ma'mur, and that's where the kids of the the youngsters who pass away young they get to go and they stay with him all the way till uh, the um, Qiyamah starts. So that's the second point I wanted to mention, just about the prophets, the wisdom of the prophets. The third thing I want to mention. Is Masjid al-Aqsa and the importance of Masjid, the importance of Masjid al-Aqsa? Allah Taala could have easily sent Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam straight up to the heavens, but why was it stopped first at Masjid al-Aqsa? And it's the only time Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually left Hijaz, the Arabian Peninsula, to go to uh, out of the Arabian Peninsula. This is why to stop at Masjid al-Aqsa and it's to show the importance, because Allah had said that there's three holy places: Mecca, Medina. Makkah al-Mukarramah, Medina al-Munawwara, and Masjid al-Aqsa, or Jerusalem, that whole area. And Rasulullah Sallallahu was born in one, he was going to migrate to the other. But he never would have visited the third. So Allah Taala made this entire journey, you could say, just to go visit that place. This shows the importance of that place. Rasulullah Sallallahu later said in a hadith that no handspan in this area of Al-Quds, except a prophet, has stood there and worshipped Allah Taala. Imagine this place. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, he was kind of... Allah Taala, because of the actions of his people, they were banned from going back into uh, Al Quds. But he still made dua to Allah Taala as a last wish that, Oh Allah, allow me to be buried. Um, Masjid Al Aqsa. Just I want to be buried close, a stone's throw away. I know I can't be buried inside. And Allah Taala accepted this, and he was buried just outside. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, If I was there, I would have shown you exactly where his grave is, uh, under the red pile, Kathir Al Ahmad, under like a red hill. And the scholars say as well, some of my teachers who went, they said you feel it's obviously like a red hill. But something looks very reddish. You can just sense it. And that's where Musa is buried. Ibrahim is also buried, etc. So this is the importance. It was the first Qibla. All the way to 18 months after Hijrah. After migration. So the entirety of the Makkah period, Rasulullah would pray towards the Kaaba. But actually towards Masjid Al-Aqsa. In one direction. The Kaaba and Masjid Al-Aqsa. And even in Medina for 18 months, Rasulullah prayed towards Masjid Al-Aqsa. So the first Qibla. The second Masjid. It was built 40 years after the Kaaba. So the first Qibla, the second Masjid. It's the third Haram, the third holy site. Sometimes we always talk about, I'm going to the Haram, I'm going to the Haram, and we automatically think the sacred place. We're talking about Makkah to Mukarram, Medina to Munawara, but we never say, I'm going to the Haram, and we intend Al-Aqsa. We should. Because Rasulullah Sallallahu himself said it's Haram. Allah says, Alladhi barakna hawlahu, we blessed it ourselves. Allah so that, that doesn't, the Quran doesn't mention this about Makkah or Medina. He says this about Al-Aqsa. What's another virtue of this place? Rasulullah Sallallahu led all the prophets, this is unique. And actually, we sometimes have to think, if the Qibla was at Aqsa, how did the prophet stand? It wasn't just in one way. He must have been around. Sometimes we never even thought about this. He must have been around. The masjid must have been in the middle. And they must have been praying around it. Because the Qibla was the middle. So he wouldn't have been praying straight. So this is another unique virtue of Al-Aqsa. So we have to understand that our hearts, every single Muslim's heart, should be connected to Masjid Al-Aqsa. So what, what can I do for Masjid Al-Aqsa? We have to remember now in Ramadan, every single year the same story happens. These Zionists and these illegal settlers, they up their, their efforts in Ramadan. And especially in the last 10 days and especially on Eid. That these believers that are going to worship Allah are more standing in Tarawi, fasting, etc. Doing itikaf. How can we now disrupt their routine? Disrupt their connection with Allah Taala. So we have to make sure that we never become desensitized. We never move on from this thing, oh, every year it's going to happen now. now. These, these people are going through it, we can't help. But every, I have to make sure I'm constantly making dua. 
constantly making dua for Masjid Al-Aqsa and the people in Masjid Al-Aqsa because they are the beloveds of Allah holding on, they could easily sell their homes and they could get really a lot of money like millions are being offered just for small homes that are around them areas but these people are strong, have strong Iman and they're not giving this, why? because they know of the virtue of staying in Al-Aqsa imagine these people are leading Salah and there's bombs going off behind them but they're not moving and there's so many stories I can mention we heard from the Imam himself in Al-Aqsa but now is not the time so we have to ensure that our hearts the hearts of every believer, whether we like it or not, is connected to Al-Aqsa. And we have to make sure we're constantly making dua. What can we do personally? Make sure we visit. Make sure we visit. Rasulullah SAW said, don't in- intend to do any journey except for three masajid. Don't intend, I'm going to go visit just this masjid. I can go to another country just to see the blue mosque, for example. Because there's no virtue of any mosque over another, except these three. And Rasulullah SAW said, you can intend to visit the masjid of Rasulullah SAW, Masjid of Nabwi. You can visit the masjid in Makkah al Mukarramah, the Kaaba, obviously. And you can intend to visit Al-Aqsa. So we should make this intention that we should go visit. We can do it in one trip if possible or however we want to do it. But try to ensure that we all try to constantly visit Masjid Al-Aqsa. As long as they get visitors, especially visitors from the West, then they know they can't go fully and completely uh, do whatever they want to plan. As long as there's visitors still coming in, there's a door and visitors from the West are coming in. People who have citizenship in these countries, England, America, Canada, Cayman Islands, these kind of places then they know they can't do exactly what they want. So we have to constantly visit Masjid Al-Aqsa. The last thing I want to mention, and one last virtue, virtue of Masjid Al-Aqsa I just mentioned, is that a person who prays in Mecca to al gets the reward of 100,000 Salah, in Medin to Munawar of 1,000 Salah, and in Masjid Al-Aqsa we get the reward of 500. Uh, one last thing I want to mention regarding Isra and Mi'raj, and what we can learn from this, <coughs> is the reaction of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. When this whole journey happened, and remember this journey was not a dream. It was not a dream. Or else why would Allah Ta'ala specifically mention it in the Quran? Why was there a need for a creature? All of these things. It was not a dream. Rather, <coughs> it was taken, Rasulullah was taken by his physical self up to Allah Ta'ala. Wa ta'ala. So now when he's come back, and he even described Masjid Al-Aqsa to the non-Muslims, to the Jews, etc. who knew how it looked, they came to Abu Bakr and they thought, now Abu Bakr won't accept this. Just uh, draw the curtain, please. Open the curtain, put the partition up, please, and complete that last final song. Um, they came to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu and they said to him, Now, look, this is what Muhammad is saying, your, your companion is saying. And they thought Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu would, would waver, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala would get doubts. He said, Did Muhammad say this? Finally, it's true. Without even listening to the full story. He said, Muhammad said this is true. And this, my dear respective brothers, is why Allah ta'ala gave him the title of Siddiq. The one who, no, number one, he's truthful. And he accepted from Allah and Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam straight away, without any doubts, without thinking twice. And this is how we should be for all the commands of Allah Ta'ala. It's very important. We shouldn't be such that I hear that Allah Ta'ala wants me to do this, but why? It's not enough for me for some reason that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told me. I have to now think rationally, logically, there must be some wisdom, there must be some health benefits. Suddenly now we're looking for health benefits. I have to be such... Yes, it's a different question if somebody from outside asks and now we're confused, okay, now we need to ask or something or we need to check it out. But I myself should be comfortable. Anything that is authentically from Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the scholars accepted it and the Sahaba acted upon it, then I shouldn't need to think rationally, think logically, think there must be a wisdom behind this. Why does Allah want me to do this? Once great scholar, Hakim al-Ummah, rahmatullahi he mentions that to, to look for rational and uh, rational reasons and logic and wisdom behind every single Command of Allah Ta'ala is a sign of weak Iman. It's a sign of weak Iman. It's not a sign of trying to understand our faith more. It's not. We have to get this out of head. Shaitan can play with us through this. It's a sign of weak Iman. So I have to see that I have to take what Allah and the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi wants without questioning. And then later on, if the wisdom opens up to me, this is no issue. We also accept the wisdom as well. One day the wisdom may go, but the action still remains. Allah Ta'ala gives ability to act on what we said.